Welcome to Neurocritical Care On Call webinar series. Um, this week we're excited to present um, intracranial hemorrhage reversal for general intensivists. I'm Dr. William Merwin. I'm a internal medicine uh, physician. I'm here today with Dr. Saya Farouk. She's a neuro IC pharmacist. Um, we're gonna be talking about the data related to um, intracranial hemorrhage in patients who are on antiplatelet and anticoagulant medications from the perspective of the general medical ICU. Um, so to start off, um, we see a lot of patients who present with intracranial hemorrhage. Typically, these patients will come through the ED. Um, typically, by the time they get to us, they've already been seen by neurosurgery. And if these patients are on antiplatelet medications, we've typically already received um, recommendations about uh, which reversal agent to use by the time they get up to us. We see a variety of um, recommendations given. Um, so Dr. Froak, based on your experience and review of the literature, um, what is the data um, about reversing antiplatelet agents? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, so um, I think, as you mentioned, we see a lot of patients in the community with antiplatelets. And, you know, I think that um, when it comes to antiplatelets, what is important for um, general intensivists to know is that not all antiplatelets have the same mechanism of action. So when you think about them, um, the most probably efficient way to think about them is that are they reversible antiplatelets or irreversible and what type of antiplatelet my patient was on before coming to the hospital. You know, with a reversible agent such as clopidogrel or aspirin or prasugrel, uh, it is a little bit difficult because your antiplatelet activity will be there for the life of the platelet. It is irreversible, right? So when that happens, you really need new platelets to be um, produced um, by the body and released into the bloodstream to basically counteract that antiplatelet activity. With reversible agents, you know, such as Ticagrelor, which is a newer agent, it's a little bit easier. So once three to five half-lives of the, the drug is um, basically passed, you are back to your normal platelet activity. So again, it's just uh, important to mention that with a reversible agents, you have that platelet inhibition for the, for the life of your platelet. Platelet. So that's that's the challenge that we see. And I think based on that mechanism of action, it seems very reasonable that people would try um, platelet mm -hmm. transfusion to um, reverse mm -hmm. these agents. Right. Do you mind talking about the Sentinel trials? Yeah. Um, about uh, platelet, platelet right. transfusions. Sure. Um, you know, I think uh, you're bringing up such a good point. I I think that. Um, commonly, we see um, a lot of our, you know, colleagues um, recommending platelet transfusion, and, uh, and then the question is, what's the evidence behind that? Um, two trials really come into mind, and, you know, these are the trials that we teach on rounds, and we try to make sure people are aware of. The first trial that is a little bit older, um, it's a prospective study that was done actually in um, Asian patients, and these patients uh, received aspirin and they had um, a basal ganglia bleed and they went for urgent craniotomy. What they found was that when these patients received platelet transfusion and they were actually sensitive to aspirin, so they actually checked for that, if they were sensitive to aspirin and they received platelet transfusion, um, they actually had better outcomes. That was evident by rate and volume of ICH expansion. Uh, so better rates of ICH when they came out of UR, better volume of ICH on repeat head CT. They also had better um, ADL scores, which is, you know, activities of daily living, so better functional status and mortality also improved. So pretty impressive, positive trial. Um, despite that, I think there's some critiques to the trial. Uh, one is that, you know, this uh, population was mostly Chinese and so not really uh, generalizable to our patient population in North America. Also, a lot of these patients went for craniotomy in the setting of this basal ganglia bleed, which is not our common practice in North America. Now, uh, a newer study, the PATCH trial that was published in 2016 in Lancet, actually, they found something totally different. These patients received um, either aspirin or uh, uh, clopidogrel or celestazole, and some people, few patients had two anti or anti platelets on board. And what they found was that when they gave these patients platelet transfusions, not only they didn't do better, but odds of death or dependence uh, were higher at three months. So, uh, and also serious adverse events uh, were higher in patients who received the transfusion. So I think it's just a reminder for all of us, you know, as um, people that are in critical care, that platelet transfusion is not benign. We see infections, we see lung-related complications, um, we see DIC and coagulopathy with that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think a lot of times you forget that platelet transfusion is actually at the highest rate of pulmonary complications, like trolley mm -hmm. as opposed to any other type of um, transfusions, probably because they come from, they're pulled from multiple donors is probably um, the reason why. So it's mm -hmm. definitely not a benign intervention. Um, I think another caveat to the patch trial is that they excluded patients who had platelet counts below 100,000. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. we don't know necessarily yeah. That these patients um, aren't are going to have the same kind of adverse yeah. reactions or outcomes, those patients yeah. have. and then um, I think the last um, thing to talk about is um, I a lot of times will the other major treatment we see for um, antiplatelet related ICH is we see patients being given TDAPP. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Fro, do you mind talking about the Sentinel trials sure. uh, for this intervention as well? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, as you said, definitely the ABP is mentioned every single time we have these patients on rounds or in the ED, you know, we get um, neurosurgery or neurology residents asking about it. Um, new studies are out there, you know, within the past year, I think at least there's three that I know about um, that, you know, they're all, uh, to be fair, though, they're all single centered or all retrospective. So it should be kind of taken into account before making a solid recommendation. Um, two of those studies that were published and they looked at DDVP only, uh, sub-Q to do so 0.3 mics per kg, I should say probably 0 0.3 to 0.4 mics per kg um, IV, um, they found that um, when they look at ICH expansion um, on repeat head, head CT, they found a reduction of that ICH expansion. So uh, that was pretty, you know, kind of promising. However, they didn't find any functional improvement or MRS uh, change uh, after giving um, DDAVP. Also, risk of thrombosis or serum sodium reduction um, were similar in patients. Mm -hmm. Now, there was one trial that you know, was published in Critical Care Medicine again within the past year, and what they found was that uh, patients who received DDAVP and got platelet transfusion at the same time, they actually didn't have that um, uh, improvement on head CT when they look at the ICH expansion. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I think it, it, it's retrospective, it's hard really to assess, but maybe the fact that they got platelet transfusion and the fact that we know platelets are pro-inflammatory and the fact that there's a lot of complications with platelet transfusion, maybe that benefit wasn't seen uh, when that DDAVP intervention was you know, um, basically combined with um, platelet transfusion. Yeah, I think to summarize, it seems like so far we only have low quality trials, but they do point towards um, decreased rates of ICH expansion. And then based on other trials, we know that increased rates of ICH expansion are associated with poor So it seems like a reasonable intervention at yeah. this time. So. Yeah, 100%. All right, so let's shift topics uh, to intracranial hemorrhage in patients with oral anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, when all of these uh, new oral anticoagulants came out on the market, um, that was before there were any reversal agents, and I think that yeah. scared a lot of physicians. For sure. Now. Yeah. Um, I think the good news is that we do now have reversal mm -hmm. agents, and we also know that these patients overall have lower rates of intracranial hemorrhage compared to Coumadin, um, which points to their general safety. Um, what do you think general intensivists should know about oral anticoagulants in patients with endocrine hemorrhage? Yeah, that's a good point. I think, you know, as you said, back in the day, we saw a lot of warfarin-related bleed. And mm -hmm. um, the DOHACs came along, and we knew that they were much better for ICH rates, but the fact that there was no specific reversal agent made uh, people concerned. But now there are options. Um, before I think we get into options, as we said, there are a couple of things to think about as, you know, intensivist uh, treating these patients. The first is that, you know, what is the half-life of the medication that we're dealing with? And mm -hmm. then also, what is the degree of renal clearance? So, you know, thinking about these agents such as, you know, Dibigatran, Epixaban, Rivaroxaban, Adoxaban, which we don't really see that much, um, uh, the half-lives are anywhere from 7 to 12 hours, so, you know, thinking about three to five half-lives for these drugs to be um, out of the system, you probably can think about if anybody comes in with a normal renal function and they took these medications within the past 40 hours, they are at risk of, you know, that bleed mm -hmm. and getting worse, so they should be reversed. Um, 
Also, the degree of renal clearance is important um, for some drugs, such as the Vigotran, um, in renal failure, you could expect the half-life to be as um, delayed as 24 hours. So technically speaking, those patients at risk of ICH expansion, even within five days of, you know, last time that they took that medication. I think all of that being said, I think all neurointensivists probably agree with me that clinical, you know, scenarios should be taken into account and, you know, uh, risk versus benefit is super important. So the neuro exam of the patient, you know, the imaging and all of that should be taken into account. If you have somebody with GCS of 15 and, you know, minimal bleed on the FCT, mm -hmm. maybe the benefit of reversing is not going to outweigh the risk given that these agents are prothrombotic when you give them as reversal agents. And a lot of these patients are already at risk of thrombosis because of ICH and the inflammatory, pro-inflammatory state that they're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't really see Depagatrin very much. Uh, we see it occasionally. Yeah. Um, I do remember um, Praxbind uh, coming yeah. over the market five or six years ago. Yeah. Um, so when these patients do come in with um, ICH. ICH related to the other agents, um, the agents have seen used have seen uh, PCC, activated PCC, and adexamet. Yeah. Um, do you mind talking about the, the relevant trials for the efficacy of these meds? Sure. Um, as you said, I think um, it is a little bit confusing, to be honest, uh, when it comes to these options. Uh, I think sometimes people, um, for example, in our institution say, well, you know, PCC, and then um, the, clar the next clarification question is that, do you mean four piece, four factor PCC? Do you mean three factor PCC? Do you mean activated PCC? Um, so to clarify that, I just wanted to, um, to speak to that for a few minutes. So there is four-factor PCC, which is typically the, the one that is mostly available in North America is Kcentra. It has, um, you know, factor 2, 7, 9, and 10, all these factors that are inhibited by, um, you know, warfarin, um, which is why initially that was the agent of choice for, you know, warfarin reversal. Um, after, I should say, FFP, that's a new development. Um, it does contain some heparin, so somebody with a recent history of HIT, we should consider that. Um, and then it has an immediate onset of action, you know, it should be uh, immediately effective and all of that. When we talk about activated PCC or APCC, that's activated four-factor PCC that it has factor 2, 7, 9, and 10, but the activated factor 7 in that is much higher than Kcentra. Uh, it, um, again, is very quick acting, so the benefits should be, you know, um, should be seen immediately after administration. It does not contain heparin, so if somebody has a history of HIT, um, that's, uh, you know, um, is a safe option. Uh, now, indexinate, um, you know, indexinate alpha um, is the only FDA-approved drug for uh, tiny inhibitor-related uh, bleed. It uh, is, you know, a synthetic uh, recombinant um, factor 10A. So what it does is that it's been designed to bind to all these tiny inhibitors, such as apixaban, adoxaban, rivaroxaban, and make them inactive. Mm -hmm. There's also, you know, um, some thrombin production that is helping with its, you know, inhibition of anticoagulation activity. So all of that being said, now where's the evidence, right? You have all these options to choose from, but where's the evidence? Well, uh, there is an ongoing study that is looking at all these, or I shouldn't say all these agents, but it's looking at uh, probably, you know, indexment versus standard of care. But for now, what we have is studies that look at uh, PCC, including um, Case Central or FIBA, and we have studies that looked at um, indexin alone. In the PCC studies, what we know so far is that uh, when they gave PCC to these patients with ICH bleed, um, the rate of um, good or excellent hemostasis was about 70 to 80 percent, and the risk of thrombosis is about 5 percent or less. Now, I think Another question that will come up in the general critical care setting is that what is good or excellent hemostasis? So what happens is that based on some critical care related um, literature, if your um, rate of um, hematoma um, expansion or volume is, if the increase in that volume is 20% or less, that's excellent. If it's above 20%, but equal or less than 35% expansion in that hematoma volume, then it's called good. So that was 78% for PCC. And then the indexinate study, the NXA4, um, that rate was about 82%, and the rate of thrombosis there was about 
10%. So again, slightly higher rate of thrombosis, but these are not head-to-head -head studies. You know, they're kind of separate solo studies, and now we're just looking at them and trying to put them side by side and make uh, a good decision mm -hmm. uh, off of those. Heard a lot of concerns about the cost of yeah. adexamed currently. Um, are there any studies about long-term costs of these agents? And yeah, sure. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, there is a new study that was published recently by Dr. Frontera and her group. Um, they looked at their centers in New York, and what they found was that you know they look at their patient population and try to um, basically compare their uh, patients to the NX4 as the historic group. They basically match people based on their you know baseline characteristics and all that. What they found was that the rate of good or excellent homeostasis in their ICH cases was about 69%, but the risk of thrombosis was again below 5%. So that was the efficacy. As far as cost goes, to answer your question, they found that the cost for indexinib um, in that population, considering you know, their uh, insurance and Medicare and all that, would have been about 20,000 or so for indexinib patients. Uh, or if patient had received indexment versus um, about five to six thousand for the uh, case center, so definitely a, a higher cost. Uh, we think that you probably, if you get indexment, we think that based on Dr. Frontier's study, um, those patients would exceed the that cost would exceed the entire hospital's reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely important. It's definitely something to think about. And maybe for that reason, a lot of institutions have not been, you know, adding that agent to their formulary. I think if you had to summarize the big picture of um, what we know and don't know about um, reversal of DOAX, what would you, how would you summarize that overall? I think, you know, it's, it, it is hard to try to compare these, you know, agents because, um, we don't really know, we haven't even matched these patients' baseline characteristics and, um, some of these were retrospective in nature, especially in the PCC group. But I think um, one thing I think we know is that the rate of good or excellent homeostasis for, for, for PCC was around 70 to 80 percent. So it's comparable to what we saw in the NX04 group. Um, the rate of thrombosis, I think, we see that is lower than what we saw in the NX04. All of that being said, you know, 10 percent versus probably 5 percent or less in the four PCC groups. Um, and except for slow recruiting patients, you know, um, we don't really know if there are other reasons for these patients to be at high risk of thrombosis. We know that ICH by itself is a prothrombotic state. And we know that a lot of these patients have reasons to be prothrombotic because they're on anticoagulation. So it's hard to, to assess that. But I think um, it is probably fair to say that 4 pieces or active 4 pcc is, is a reasonable option despite the lack of FDA approval in their status. Um, as a matter of fact, the European Stroke Organization and the American Society of Hematology um, is recommending four-factor PCC uh, for these patients. Um, un, un, um, actually, unless there is a head-to-head -head trial that is showing one agent is better than the other. So uh, we're kind of just, I think, waiting for more results to come out to make that final conclusion or decision. Yeah, it'll definitely be very interesting to see. Yeah, for trials sure. will come out over the next couple of years and yeah. hopefully it'll be a good head to head trial. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Froke. I feel much better equipped to manage uh, reversal and endocrine hemorrhage patients. And thank you all for joining us.